Welcome everyone. Um, happy Earth Day. And we're so happy to have Faith here with us today. Um, <clears throat> operating out of uh, Fairfield, Iowa. I'm proud to say she's our BFA agronomist. Mm -hmm. um, we've, uh, you know, had the first couple months be a, a number of elders and, you know, framing and, and Faith's a brilliant student, um, practitioner, um, I think she's intending to start off with soil tests and numbers and things, but hopefully end up with a deeper relationship with the land. And the first of a number of youngers we have here, hoping to bring that, that conversation forward um, with many voices. So you all set, Faith? I think so. All right. I'll share my away. screen. And I'll be looking over to my left because that's where my notes are and I will need them. <laughs> um, I do, yeah, hello. Um, thank you so much for being interested in these topics and, and joining this conversation today. Uh, it's really an honor to present for the BFA. Um, you know, as Dan said, I'm I'm still a fledgling a fledgling in this realm. Uh, I don't think he said that, but that's the way I feel. I'm not an expert. Um, these are observations that I've gleaned over the time that I've been deeply focused on soil health, and that is my um, you know that's my strength. I'm deeply focused. I am continuously curious, a perennial student. Um, I'm someone who really just wants to understand. And so I wanna remain humble in this and um, just say that I don't know what I don't know. Um, and if you do know what I don't know, please inform me um, in a kind way. Um, I wanna learn and I wanna know more. Uh, I'm not gonna go straight into soil tests or numbers. I am gonna go into story. That's the way I learn well um, is through story and narrative. So I want to share from that perspective, because again, I'm not an expert. So I am well informed. I'm knowledgeable, but I do not consider myself an expert as of yet. And so I'm formulating this a, and uh, assimilating this information through the lens that I have and creating story um, by doing so. Again, beautiful to be here on Earth Day. It is such an honor. I can't say that there's any job or any work that I would rather do that I feel more in place right now on this planet to do other than be in service to this planet. It is such an immense, um, mm, it's an immense honor to be in service to this planet. And so if I can offer myself to that for the rest of my life, I will do so. I find great joy in it. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about some really easy observations that you can do with equipment that you have in your shed or you can purchase at the local hardware store. <clears throat> but the goal in sharing these practices, these in field observational assessments, the, um, you know, the deeper look into the microbial diversity, complexity, health of the soil. And in addition, those uh, laboratory tests that we'll mention towards the end, the additional um, observations and data points you can collect. The goal is really to encourage relationship building with the land that you've committed yourself to being a steward of. Being a steward of land is, in my mind, probably not a whole lot different from you know being a steward to any living being. 
um, you know, being a parent, being uh, a caregiver of others, being, um, uh, you know, taking care of animals. It's our, um, it's our great, you know, ability to be able to be in service and be stewards of living complex systems, living um, entities. So I, I would um, invite you all just to dig a little deeper into the relationship that you have with the land that you steward and to stay curious. Hmm. So I wanna tell you a story of two seeds, two weeds and three soils. And we're gonna view it through story. Like I mentioned, that helps me learn better when I can frame things in a way that I understand. Um, of course, uh, just go ahead and place the warning that there will be quite a bit of anthropo anthropomorphization. Um, that's how I tell stories. And I apologize if that seems like I'm degrading the complexity of these systems. I wanna make it simple and I don't wanna come across as if I understand these topics better than I do. And so I was able to lace them together through story to make them more simple for me to understand and hopefully more simple for others to understand. They're very complex. There are so many variables in the, the inner workings of soils, of the relationships between soils and microbes and plants, and you know, soils and microbes and minerals. And you know, there's so many um, complex interrelationships and ways of, of communicating for those microbes and plants and, and you know, inner, it's just, it's so complex. There's just so much. And science is finally catching up. You know, we've been working in a very reductionistic framework for so long in our observations that we've missed the forest for the trees. And now I feel as though with the science that's being done as we speak, the complexity of those holistic systems are starting to be appreciated and how those interlinked systems function together to create a more beautiful complex whole that functions very well. And so I really love that uh, Kieran brought up the word holobiont uh, two weeks ago. It's a word that I'm only just familiar with in the last year but I love it. I love the concept of holobiont. I love um, just really thinking of what is a holobiont. I first heard of that word, I do believe from Christine Jones, Dr. Christine Jones uh, in the last year, but it could have also been Dr. Um, Anna Christina Shook. I don't remember who I heard it from first, but both speak to holobionts. Dr. Christine Jones is speaking at it from the perspective of plants. And Dr. Christina, Anna, Anne Christina Shook is talking from uh, the perspective of humans. And so the similarities are immense. And I so appreciate looking at the way systems function through that lens of a holobiont. So this is a definition of a holobiont. And you know, you see that it's a, an assemblage. There's a host, and then there are the supporting entities that are associated with that host. And in thinking through, you know, in observing and thinking through that lens, I've had um, just this deep desire to want to see the land that I manage as a holobiont. And I'm just a member of that holobiont, along with the frogs and the birds and the earthworms and the mycorrhizal fungi, each in their own right are holobionts themselves. But together, we form another holobiont. And I'm just a part of it. And I, so I think that perhaps maybe we could start to think of our 
our farms, the land that we steward or the ecosystems that we love to visit and love to care for as holobionts, I know that um, more than likely is not going to fly <laughs> with many people. Um, but I feel like if it would fly, it could potentially fly in this community. And um, if we start to think of the systems that we are a part of, the land that we steward as a, a whole being, a whole abiant, then perhaps maybe um, we could better see how to be in service to that space, better see how our actions impede the functioning of that system. And so I'll start with the tale of two seeds. And so first I would love to say that, um, you know, it, it really doesn't matter which two seeds, which two beings, which two entities, it's, a story that could be superimposed on just about any system. <laughs> any, you know, whether it be two farms, whether it be, you know, two animals, two sheep, two humans. So the first seed was produced by a mother plant that grew in an environmentally balanced soil. An environmentally um, balanced space. The soil was structured. It was biologically diverse. The soils were generated from mineral mineralogically diverse parent material. Like I said, the soils were rich in biology. Many, many biological functional groups were present. Because there were many unique microhabitats, many environments, many niches. Niches are created when complexity is allowed to evolve. There's a coevolutionary process where competing, competing niches, like a foraging niche or uh, you know, a territorial niche. When there's competition, there's an opportunity for a complexity to happen. And so if you have a, uh, Tom Wessel speaks of this very um, eloquently. I, I think he speaks to it very well, how species co-evolve and will either, um, provided that time is, is, significant in that co-evolution, co there's an opportunity for uh, diversification in niches. And so you can have two birds feeding off of the same tree and they could potentially decimate the food source, the foraging, you know, their food sources. But if the birds have co-evolved together, they will develop feeding niches unique to themselves. And so it could be the shape of their beak. It could be um, the timing that they prefer to feed, but there will be a diversification in those niches. And so that happens with any system when allowed to diversify into more complex systems. So, the niches. Because the diversity in the functional specialization, nutrients were being cycled well. You have microorganisms that specialize in the soil. When a soil is well structured and well aggregated, you have these microclimates in the soil. You have these micro and macro pores. Micro pores are developed by bacteria who, when they produce or excrete their biofilm, the mucilages that they create their biofilms with, they create um, habitat for themselves. They create their own little microhabitats. And so those microaggregates are held together with those bacterial glues, which tend to be alkaline. They're small little microaggregates, can hardly be seen with the naked eye. 
And so those microaggregates are pulled together by filamentous organisms organisms that either fungal or like an actinomyces that can create a long filamentous structure to lace together those microaggregates into macroaggregates. Inside those macroaggregates, you have microclimates. Inside those macroaggregates, you have a opportunity for water to be um, collected in those pore spaces. That's an anaerobic environment. And so you have specialized organisms that are only able to function in those low oxygen environments. And so in order to do that, you have to have those macro aggregates in the soil. One of the special organisms, specialized organisms that would need to be um, in a low oxygen environment would be the nitrogen fixing organisms. And so nitrogen fixing organisms can exist inside the micro pores, inside the macro aggregates and fix into from the atmosphere. So those are, that's an example of a specialized organism that would be available in a system that was well-structured, that was balanced. It's not homogeneous. It is very complex with a lot of different habitats, a lot of different terrains to support the niches in specialization in microorganisms. So when you have a soil that is functioning like that, your soil organic, soil organic matter is able to cycle and it'll cycle in different ways. It'll cycle towards humus. It'll uh, initially be worked on by bacterial organisms and decomposer organisms. Fungal decomposing organisms will continue to assimilate that organic matter, creating more complex molecules until it is stored in a stable form as humus, organic carbon stored as humus in the soil. Another way that that soil organic matter will funk will um, cycle will be as a food source and will be respired from the microorganisms in a very biologically balanced soil. And so that CO2 that is released by those microorganisms as they respire, because they consume oxygen in that exterior microaggregate macroaggregate um, space, you know, you have a complex suite of different organisms that exist on a gradient of oxygen concentrations. And so the organisms that breathe in oxygen will respire that CO2. That CO2 then is released from a well aggregated soil that has good gas exchange it is released into the um, airspace just below the plants. And then plants can take that CO2, which is such a gift to them, and take that CO2 and the water that was delivered by the mycorrhizal fungi that would be a part of that complex biological system in a well-structured soil, in a well-aggregated soil. Mycorrhizal fungi would supply also beyond the water, they would supply any element that they had access to provide, they're specialists. They tend to do a lot in the way of phosphorus uh, solubilization, providing um, phosphorus, calcium, pretty much any um, known essential element for plant life, successful um, reproduction is provided by the mycorrhizal fungi. So they take the water that they can access themselves in the, in the soil solution, but also the water provided by the mycorrhizal fungi, all the elements that are provided by the microorganisms that are cycling those nutrients in the soil very efficiently for them. And then they take the energy from the sun and they, as we all know, create sugars that are then returned back to the soil to keep that flywheel of functional, functional um, soil 
cycling. Carbon, nutrients, biological life, organic matter, it's a continual cycle that needs to be fed on a regular continual basis. But that mother plant was well fed, her needs were met to sufficiency. The seeds that were produced by that mother plant were well educated for the environment that they will be dropped into if it is in nature. Um, that seed then being well informed of the community of microorganisms that will be there to support it. That seed itself is actually supplied with its own core seed microbiome by that mother plant. Through the work that Dr. James White has brought forth in the last two years, and I became familiar with it uh, via John Kemp's amazing um, <laughs> continual sharing of cutting edge, regenerative ag, soil health, plant health awarenesses. Um, James White's work is just mind blowing. I, I heard first about this specific topic, the rhizophagy topic at the 2019 um, Soil and Nutrition Conference. How I miss being there in person, but I'm so grateful to be here right now. Um, so rhizophagy is an awareness that plants are actually taking in living microbes through their growing root tips and cycling those nutrient or cycling those microorganisms, literally cycling them, but um, breaking down a portion of those microorganisms. And it's your firmicutes, it's your actinomyces, it's your bacteria, primarily single celled microorganisms that are taken in through the root tip. They are compartmentalized outside of the cell membrane. Um, they are moved through the plant. A portion of their membranes, if you, they're consumed, in essence, they are consumed. A portion are consumed, a portion are not consumed, a portion are partly consumed. Um, what happens is they move through the plant uh, root into the area where a root hair could be initiated. And James White's work, which you will learn about in the near future through his presentations uh, or his presentation here at the conference, but those microorganisms, rhizophagous microorganisms, endophytes, you know, they are um, inside the plant at that moment. Some would continue up through the plant and become long-lived residents inside that plant as an endophyte. That is what a holobiont is. Plant is a holobiont, just as we are holobionts. There is not one inch on my body that is not just completely inundated with microorganisms, internal or external. Same with the plant, internal, external, rhizosphere, phylosphere. They're completely covered, just as we are. And so with that rhizophagous cycle, that rhizophagy cycle, plants are able to consume living microbes are able to actually farm microbes. They take the microbes into their, into their root system, excrete them through a root hair, that root hair being initiated by that cycle, that rhizophagy cycle. They are excreted out into the rhizosphere of that plant. And then they are fed with an appropriate suite of sugars and compounds in order for them to rebuild their membranes and continue on doing their specialist work in the soil that supports the plant. So a seed, when it is grown by a healthy mother plant, is equipped with its own seed core microbiome, just as a human is equipped with its microbiome from the mother, a seed is as well. And so a seed that is produced in a balanced system where a diverse suite of biological, um, you know, microbi microbiological um, entities existed, complex um, suite of nutrients supplied, 
all needs met, you've got a very healthy seed that is well-informed and ready to just take on the world. So for, for a seed that does not have a mother plant that was equipped in that way, it's a different story. Um, I do wanna just briefly, these are photos, all of these photos I do believe are gonna pretty much be um, just things I've shot in the most recent future, just wanting to, you know, <laughs> make my own slides and be authentic at the same time. Um, this is the tiniest little, um, let me see if I can get my cursor over here. This right here is a sunflower seed and you can see here on the root, and you can see tiny little um, root hairs. It's hard to really see that because it's not a very well-focused image, but this seed has not started to photosynthesize yet. There are no leaves, but that seed is sending out root exudates <laughs> before it's starting to photosynthesize. And so, what you can do is you can initiate this by supplying your seed with some of those chemical messages that microorganisms produce in the substrates that they exist in. And so that's a biostimulant. Um, and so you can, you can actually use biostimulants to help inform a seed that there is a broad suite of microorganisms just waiting on the outside of that seed coat and that producing root exudates before they even start to photosynthesize, which would be a good idea. You would want that seed to go ahead and start to develop a strong biological community to cycle nutrients before it started to photosynthesize. If indeed you were putting that soil into a very biologically diverse soil, because that seed then would be equipped with a community of support that would supply all the nutrients that it need and it needed, and it would actually have built those relationships in that very formative, really early uh, embryonic stage. And so those relationships would be more complex, I think, and um, stronger. And so this is just a wheat seed here that um, is doing something similar. You know, it's, it has already started to <clears throat> push its leaf up towards, or its blade up towards the sun and would soon start to photosynthesize, but it's still even too young to be photosynthesizing. But it's already in the process of developing rhizosheaths. And so <clears throat> a rhizosheath is a column of soil that sheaths the exterior of a root. And just like a macro aggregate, the same processes that happen inside of a soil macro aggregate that those visual structured uh, components of soil, that is what happens also in that rhizosheath. So this rhizosheath is full of microorganisms that are already fixing nitrogen, that are already supplying soluble calcium and phosphorus. They're already protecting this root. And so this root would not be as susceptible to invaders. It would not be as susceptible to abiotic stresses. This is not a, you can find photographs on the web of these beautiful dreadlocked roots and Hopefully we'll all grow our plants to be that healthy. But I just wanted to give you an example of what it might look like from the very beginning. So the other seed, the second seed, it wasn't so lucky. Um, the mother plant that produced that seed was grown in compacted soil where gas exchange and water infiltration and evaporation were stymied. The soil didn't cycle nutrients well. It was homogene, or you know, it was homogenized. It was um, compacted, and so it was like that Sunday soil that would be saturated 
and un you couldn't walk on it. It was so saturated um, right after a rain event. Water would pool and would run off. The soil would not permit the water to percolate down through the profile to charge those macro pores that did not exist in that soil. So you've got a soil that will go through a roller coaster. It will be super saturated for a couple of days after a rain event or maybe a week or more. And then that soil will dry out and become oxidized. There will be no water for that um, plant to have access to because there's no holding capacity for that water. That plant will be dependent on soluble nutrients through passive flow. It will not have a microbial community, or at least not a very complex specialized one, to cycle nutrients for it, to engage in the rhizophagy cycle, to meet its needs. And so that plant, that mother plant will be, it will be um, dependent on those soluble nutrients. And in many cases, those will be supplied um, in the way of a, a soluble fertilizer or a high, high analysis fertilizer. So that mother plant didn't have a community of microorganisms um, to share with its seed, didn't have a good microbiome itself to share with that seed for the next generation. And so that next generation seed was not well educated. It didn't understand um, how to adapt, evolve in the world that it was a part of or about to be a part of that it would inhabit. It was kind of a, you know, a restricted existence for that plant. And what it did know is that, you know, when you see soluble nutrients, you grab them because that's how you survive. And, um, you know, it's probably not worth putting exudates out into the rhizosphere at the earliest stage before you even start to photosynthesize <laughs> because um, you don't understand why you would do that if you were that seed. So that was the story of the two seeds. You have one that is going to be able to hit the ground running and build great root systems, build great structure, be balanced genetically, possibly able to reach its genetic potential. And then you have another seed that might um, just be stymied right off the bat and not have an opportunity to really catch stride. We can support those seeds. That is probably a majority of the seed that we purchase is seed that was grown in soil that was not biologically diverse, that was not very um, potentially well-structured. It could be well-structured, but if we're working with soils that are over manipulated, they can't be well structured. You can't have earthworms in soil that is, um, you know, overly disturbed. It's just not, you know, it's not going to work very well. You'll break down the macro aggregates. You'll break down two micro aggregates, and those little micro aggregates will fill the pore spaces if they were there in those earthworm galleries, and the soil will just become more and more compacted. And so. It would behoove us to, one, save our own seed um, and grow seed and plants on very balanced soils that are able to be well structured. And then um, to get to know our soils in a way that we might be able to track whether or not they are able to support our plants in that way and how we might be able to support the development of soils um, in that way. So the story of um, the story of two weeds, I won't go as in depth with this story, but it's a similar story. Weeds are specialized. They're specialists. They have work to do. They're here letting us know what is going on with our soil. Um, and so if you have uh, a dandelion, which <laughs> that's why I put the first uh, slide photo with the shovel against the barn and the dandelions. 
Um, we just have to learn to love our weeds and learn to listen to our weeds. What are they telling us? And so if we have a dandelion in our system, what morphology does that plant have? Um, it has a low, you know, um, rosette. It's a, it's a perennial. It's going to be here for a while. It's committed to the work it's going to do. And so it has um, that low profile morphology, that rosette that will cover ground. And so you might find it in a place where, um, you know, where you need to have cover. It has a long, well, the taproot can be very long, but it's a really strong taproot. Um, and so what is it trying to do? My assumption is, is it's, it's accessing nutrients that are not accessible by weaker weak, uh, weaker um, rooted plants or plants that don't have that really strong tap root that can break through the compaction layer of the soil. They are able to go down and source nutrients that would have percolated through the soil profile and bring those up into their above ground biomass and leave it there year after year after year after year. Dandelions are also mycorrhizal. And so, and we have many of our uh, agricultural weeds that are mycorrhizal, a lot of the perennialized um, agricultural weeds could be um, associating with mycorrhizal fungi. And so are they helping to maintain mycorrhizal associations with other plants? Are they helping to permit mycorrhizal fungi to exist in an ecosystem? Yes, they are doing that. Our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, which is the type of mycorrhizal fungi that associate with a majority of the plants that we farm, unless we're farming uh, perennialized woody perennials, some of our woody perennials will associate with endo or excuse me, ectomycorrhizal. A lot of our trees associate with ectomycorrhizal blueberries with iroquois mycorrhizal fungi. There are many specialists in the mycorrhizal fungi realm, but the AM mycorrhizal fungi, fungi the arbuscule mycorrhizal fungi, associate with a lot of the annual vegetables that we like to grow, and they are not able to proliferate or even perpetuate in a fallowed system. And so if you have a fallowed system, or if you have a system that you're growing non-mycorrhizal plants in for long periods of time, more than six months, then your mycorrhizal fungi don't have an opportunity to exist. They are um, they're obligate symbiotes. They have to be associated with a living host plant and need to be fed on a regular basis. They are not, um, they're heterotrophs. They don't have a way to get carbon unless it's supplied to them. They're not like a saprophytic fungi that would be breaking down the organic matter and receiving some carbon that way, even though here recently science is kind of showing that saprophytic fungi actually are consuming plant exudates just as mycorrhizal fungi do. But so dandelion are not an indicator of a really sick soil, they're an indicator of a compacted soil where some of your soluble nutrients or some of your heavy calcium being a, 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 an element that will percolate down through the soil profile. It's an, indica it's an indicator that you are, um, you're in need of a little breaking and lifting. The, <laughs> The garlic mustard is more of, you know, it's a non-mycorrhizal mustards, brassicas, chinopods, um, amaranth species, or those plant families do not associate with mycorrhizal fungi. They're more transient. They are, they are annuals. They're small seeded. And so that seed was not equipped with an immense amount of um, nutrients when it leaves its mother plant and it breaks dormancy. And there are different reasons why seeds break dormancy. Our wheat seeds will break dormancy for different reasons. And so in the mustard family or the cruciferous family, you would have um, seeds break dormancy in more of an alkaline soil, a soil that has 
more soluble available nutrients, more than likely more soluble nitrates available. You're gonna have soil, rather rich soil. It's gonna be soil that is um, nutrient rich, but it's not complex. Those, those nutrients, those elements, those minerals, those ionic um, compounds are not complexed into biological form or into humic substances. And so you have plants like the garlic mustard that are coming in to clean up a situation, to mop up excess nutrients, not go and get more. They're just mopping up. And so one of the baseline tools that I think would be a great tool to employ is making a weed diary. Get to know which weeds are showing up in your system and observe what microclimates they're showing up in. Do some investigation, get your spade out, use the tools we're about to talk about to dig a little deeper to figure out why they showed up and what their specialist function is what role are they in your system doing? What job are they doing? And if they annoy you, if you're not able to exist with them, then what can you do to do the work that they're doing, support them in doing the work that they're doing so that they can move on, so that they don't break dormancy each season? It's not that we clean up our seed bed necessarily our weed seed bed, more success would be had, I do believe, if we did the work for them, if we allowed them to rest, their job is done. You know, we helped you continue um, through the succession. And so you can see which weeds are showing up. These are low early succession weeds here that are showing up when we have excess nutrients that need to be mopped up. So to the assessments. Um, <clears throat> move that out of the way. These are really simple tools. And yes, you can get a, you know, more sophisticated tools, but I just wanted to show you how to take tools that you might already have in your shed or that you could pick up at the grocery store or wherever and get some understanding on how your soil functions. So, you know, the most important tool you're gonna to bring into this, uh, this testing process will be your senses and, you know, tracking that information that you observe is really important so that you can set that baseline and then take these measurements again throughout the season. Maybe you do it twice, maybe you do it three times, maybe you only do it once a year at the same time. But if you're going to compare, you know, if you're going to compare spring to spring, do that. If you're gonna compare spring, summer, fall, do that. It's not a bad idea to do both and get an idea of how your systems are functioning throughout the year so that you understand where you need to step in and support your plants, support your microbes, support your soils so that they may function more effectively and are able to become a holobiont. And so we have, you know, just a number 10 can. You can get this at Walmart. You can get that just at any box store that would sell bulk vegetables. And, you know, it's a six inch diameter can. It's not gonna last very long. You'll see in the photos that this can is degraded rather quickly because I'm pounding it into the ground with a board and a sledgehammer. And it, you know, it's not that strong. And so that's where buying infiltration um, rings is a good idea, but you don't have to, you can just use this. So it's a six inch diameter can where I just marked it with a Sharpie at three and a quarter inches from the base you're going to insert it into the ground. And when I say insert, pounding it into the ground with a board and a, and a hammer. You'll need water. You'll need a receptacle that can hold 15 ounces of water. Just a standard pint jar will work out just fine. A standard pint jar, 16 ounces, just below the neck, right at the shoulder, that's a 15 ounce mark. 
<clears throat> you'll need a probe of some sort. And so I just took a standard four foot fence post and um, put a handle on it, marked it at one foot. That first blue piece of tape there is one foot, that's two foot. And then I just marked every inch from there. So this acts like a penetrometer, but it's just a probe. And so it gives you an idea of where your compaction zone starts and could potentially give you an idea of how deep your compaction layer is. In order to get a really good assessment of that, it would be a good idea to do some, some actual um, deep digging, you know, dig a, dig a two by two hole that's at least two foot deep. And uh, if you wanted to have a, a good idea of where your compaction zone starts and stops, this is a tip I picked up from John in one of his webinars where you would take a knife from the base of that base of that hole. And these are really simplistic visual assessment tools. And if these are already in your toolkit or in your pocket, please excuse the redundancy. Um, but these tools were helpful for me to start to read my soil a little better. And so I want to offer them to anyone who might need them. So you've got that two foot hole, you know, two foot, two square foot hole and take that knife. Um, you don't have to, um, you know, you don't have to have the hole be very large, but you want to be able to see and shadow and all that. So um, take the, the knife at the base of the hole and run it up to wherever you meet major resistance. And then do the same from the O horizon or from the grade, you know, on grade level down. And so you have an idea from grade to down where you hit resistance, where your compaction starts. And then coming up from the bottom, you have an idea of how thick your compaction layer is. That layer of resistance is what you're working with. And so you have an idea of what your plants have access to, how will water function in your system? Will water hit that compaction layer, compaction layer and run horizontally? Could tap-rooted um, plants, you know, whether it be your um, you know, nature-provided tap-rooted indicator plants or weeds, or if it's a cover crop that you're utilizing. And tap-rooted plants aren't necessarily the jackhammer of plants. Um, you know, a daikon is not going to break a thick compaction layer. I've definitely had daikon that were, you know, two feet, <laughs> you know, the, the, the daikon itself was two feet and, and 18 inches of that was sticking out of the ground. And so, you know, daikon are awesome, but they're not necessarily the, the fracturing tool for a deep, thick compaction zone. And so you, finding out which plants can do that for you, which plants can get in there and start to break apart that um, compaction layer. And in many cases, that's a lot to ask for a plant and I'm kind of an impatient person. And so do I need to employ a more aggressive tool once or twice? You know, is it a broad fork? It is, a, is it a subsoiler? Is it a, you know, a yeoman's plow, something of that sort? If you have open space where you can do that and you really wanna get your system off to a good start, perhaps maybe that's a good idea, but, um, you know, you have to weigh your options. And so that's what that probe tool is telling us. And then we also have our uh, most important tool, that spade shovel. And so um, that's going to give us a opportunity to look at the soil profile and how it's aggregated from zero to however deep you can pull your core. Ideally, it would be at least eight to 12 inches of a core. We're also gonna do a water stable aggregate assessment here as well. And so <clears throat> with our water infiltration, that tells us, that tells us, well, uh, are we able to change, are we able to charge our um, groundwater? That's more of a percolation test. Water infiltration and percolation tests are different, but an infiltration test will at least let us know if water is gonna be able to make its way down to percolate through that more denser subsoil. It's also gonna let us know, are we able to capture our water 
if we are having a you know four inch rain event and our soils are only able to percolate one inch of rain every 45 minutes we've just lost all that water and we lost our topsoil with it we all know that structured soil we talked about that already but that is what permits the percolation right and so seeing those macro aggregate pore spaces in our soil the structure of our soil those and you can have biological aggregation you can have physiological aggregate aggregation but the biological aggregation is where those niche environments exist that's where water can be held inside those pore spaces it's a it's a more um design engineered type of thing you know there's living purpose behind the creation of a macro aggregate and so it functions well and then our root penetration or our penetrometer or our probe is going to let us know how our roots are going to be able to make their way down through the profile and how well they will have access to the nutrients that are deeper in our subsoils many of our nutrients don't just sit around at the top of the soil um, they can be uh, percolating down through our subsoils. So the infiltration test, the, okay, so we're talking about three soils here. That's the story of three soils. I wanted to do four, but I lost one of the slides right before starting this. And so, um, and it was an interesting one, but we're gonna do three. This one is a Hugo culture, uh, Hugo culture bed that's, this one is on grade and it is, um, a bed that did not have a living cover through the winter. It was actually topped with an organic mulch material, plant-based mulch material combination of <clears throat> hay, grass clippings. There was a biostimulant, inoculant, a mineral amendment applied to the soil prior to topping it with an organic mulch. And then I topped it again with some uh, wood chips because I just wanted a complex suite of, of mulch material there that would be sure because I knew I was putting on a biostimulant. I wanted to know that there was going to be um, cover through the entire um, <clears throat> pause period, the rest. I generally do not suggest putting wood chips onto annual beds. I have a perennial polyculture where um, perennials are peppered throughout the entire system. There's not a large space between perennials. Um, even the beds where I grow annuals have perennial herbs installed every so often in those beds. And so I do use some wood chips where I know I have perennials um, that will be a part of that system. And these wood chips were rather well broken down. And so I took two of these readings. I did one in March, early March, and I did one in April. And you see for the percolation or the infiltration, sorry, uh, one minute and 26 seconds for the first pour. That was shortly after the snow had thawed. And these soils were very well hydrated. They were at fill capacity in March. In April, not so much. So you can see the, the time difference. And so what we're doing is we're taking that six inch can, we're pounding it into the soil to that um, three and a quarter inch depth. And then we're pouring 15 ounces of water in that can. And we are starting our timer on our iPhone or the camera, whatever it is, um, track when it starts immediately, once the water hits the soil and observe that percolation or infiltration to the point of glisten. Once that water has moved through the soil profile and it's no longer standing on the surface and you just see a glistening surface of um, soil, that is when you stop your timer and you track that first round. If your soil is already pre-hydrated like mine were in May, one round is probably a good indication of a one inch rain event. If your soils are not at field capacity or are rather dry. And this is not exact. And you can look into this further and get more detail, but these are observational tools that I just wanna share. Um, so if your soils are somewhat dry, then a second pour 
would be called for. And that is the one that is going to give you more of an indication of how well a one inch rain event would move through that soil in a you know, short period of time. So in April, it was 10 seconds and 30 seconds. Very quick, no issue with water infiltration. Um, looking at the soil when I did the spade test and I took out the core, just so biologically diverse. Springtime, of course, is the time when we see earthworms. It's good habitat, good terrain for them. In the springtime, there's lots of moisture. There's lots of biological debris <laughs> from the winter, you know, die-offs and things are waking up. And so there's a lot of, um, a lot of food for earthworms in the spring. And so you should see them. Um, but I was able to get an idea of my biological activity because I saw really well structured soil. I saw lots of aggregates. And when you see aggregates, that's also an indicator that you have those filamentous microorganisms, whether it be fungal, mycorrhizal, or saprophytic. Saprophytic fungi, you can see their fungal hyphae, the mycelia, that mycelia looks a little different than a root hair or tiny little roots, but somewhat similar. The usually white, usually. Um, mycorrhizal fungi you cannot see with the naked eye and so you can only just assume if other indicators are pointing in that direction you can you can clear and stain roots and look at them under the microscope but that is not necessarily um, an off-the-shelf ability and so you can learn to do it penetration this again is 38 inches of um, total length, that's that same probe that was marked at one foot, two foot, and so it's all the way down to the handle. This is my beautiful, elegant handle that I had my husband put on my tool. <laughs> and um, water aggregate, water aggregate, so water stable aggregates. So that's again, those macro aggregates primarily. How well can they hold together in the solute of water? Water is naturally. Um, an extracting solution. It's, you know, it, it, it does break things down. And are your aggregates able to hold together for a period of time? If they are, then that is a good indicator that they are being refreshed. They are um, actively being used. If they have good glues. So that could be bacterial glues, that could be glomalin from, uh, from mycorrhizal fungi. Again, that can be the filamentous structures. Our second soil was a soil that was under an oculation fabric. And so oculation just means hidden from view. And so it's, it was a black breathable fabric that would allow just the tiniest bit of moisture, moisture if there was a major saturation event, but not so much really. That, that uh, oculation fabric blocks light blocks water and there is no photo photosynthetic activity going on. Obviously, even in the down season, we don't have much, but we have some in our system. And so this particular uh, test was on a soil that I feel was treated um, less well. And first pour four minutes and 50 seconds. And that was in March. But again, this soil was under cover and was very dry. And so that first pour should have gone through rather quickly, but it didn't. Um, and the second pour took 12 minutes and 14 seconds. In April, that first pour only took a minute and 25 seconds. Still wasn't, um, you know, the soil was pretty dry, but obviously there was some microbial life going on in there. And um, the second pour was four minutes and 55 seconds. And so as our soils go through the season, they have their own ebbs and flows. And so that's why doing these tests throughout the season, just to see how well are our soils functioning? How well is water being utilized in our system? And where can we step it up? Where do we need to um, support the soils function? This uh, probe was able to go in 16 inches. The aggregation was pretty good from zero to three, but pretty blocky. And that's where that blocky 
Um, aggregation is more of a physiological, that's kind of, phys, uh, what do they call that? I can't remember. Um, it, but it's, it's actually the fracturing of the subsoils. It's not a biological design. Aggregation was okay, but I was taking my clod from this area. And so this, I don't, I didn't explain this, but this is just a piece of hardware cloth that you can get from the hardware store. Comes in a roll that's however many inches tall, usually around two feet tall and 10 feet long or whatever. It's really rigid. And so you can cut it to fit into the mouth of a jar. Use a simple um, <laughs> pipe jar, or you can use a really fancy um, straight-sided jar, however you want to do it, doesn't matter. But <clears throat> what you're looking for is how well do those aggregates hold together initially when you put it in there? Does the water become cloudy? Does the water um, become dark? You know, do does your clod just dissolve or does it hang tight for a little while? It will, with movement, and that's a good idea, after you get that initial reading and say, oh, okay, after, you know, five minutes of time, I'm still seeing 70% of that clod existing in that basket, do a little agitation, see if it's really just that they're settled and they actually have started to break apart. Just do a little agitation and see how well do things hold together. And there are soil health assessment guides where you can specifically see the rating, how to do a water stable aggregate test and see how well those clods hold together and um, what your rating is. So that was just an example of this next bed before um, jumping in. So it had a, it had a complex um, cover, you know, a complex cover crop over the winter there was uh, biological activity, like active photosynthetic activity. The microbes were being fed through this season. You can see that, and this is a Hugo culture bed as well. The, um, and that's just another element. We can talk about that too in a moment, the Hugo culture, and obviously it's gonna be structured differently. But these are old beds, really well settled. Everything's already pre, are pretty much decomposed. So it went from two minutes and 55 seconds first pour, seven minutes and 20 seconds second pour in March to 35 and 110. Um, and the, the probe went all the way down and the water stable aggregates, very stable, very little, very little discoloration. Um, these are just some indicators of, you know, what you might consider doing to support your soil. Uh, Diversity, 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 and don't be mad at your weeds. Just try to understand them and see how they are supporting your system and how you might support them in doing the work that they're doing. <clears throat> I'll move along here because we are, I am over time. So yeah, nature will balance itself. I will stop sharing. Oh, nope, stop sharing. You there, Dan? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to you, Faith, and I don't know that you should stop, actually. Oh, okay. It's, I mean, this has been a sermon. <laughs> sermon. It's really been so heartfelt and so profound and so integrated. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I well, I get excited and I'm enthusiastic yeah. about it. I could go on for hours and I do. <laughs> well, just give us, you know, take five or ten more minutes and conclude and we'll have shorter questions, but not people don't know who you are. Okay. Well, <laughs> um Bring back yeah, your like I said, and finish finish your finish your finish your story. Oh, the story. Um, I'm a uh, no, no, no. I mean, the story, you, the, the three stories. Oh, the three stories of finish the soil. It up. Finish it up. <laughs> we got 24 minutes left. We'll oh. have a couple questions at the end, but just finish okay. the story. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> I, I wanted to just bring that home, that diversity is, is the key, um, but complexity in diversity, and that we are 
Yeah, we're able we're able to just take a deeper look, you know, take a take a deeper um, peek into what is possible for our soils. I'll see if I can go back and I'll um, I'll. Where's my mouse? I'm I'm guessing you had this whole thing deeply prepared, and you had a, a couple closing comments. So go for it. Oh, good guess. Not good probably. Guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, Closing comments, it's all about diversity, like I said. And so whether it's your weeds or your cover crop or the cash crop that you're committed to, whatever it is that you are um, observing on your soil or initiating through practices in your soil, try to keep it as diverse as possible. And know that that system thrives on the diversity and it's a flywheel effect, just like the just like the flywheel effect of the carbon being sequestered or being cycled in the soil when you have very actively biologically functioning soil you have both you have humus that's being created from the organic matter from the diverse plants that are dropping that organic matter on the soil surface those microbes that are functioning in that rhizosphere and inside of those rhizosheaths are able to build the complexity um, of, of that system through that exchange. And so those, those organic matter, debris, biomass that's dropped on the surface that is broken down by the macro um, arthropods, the earthworms, the the munchers, the mulchers, those guys that are making things tinier and tinier and tinier so that they can be um, transitioned through the system so that other smaller microorganisms can break it down. So those complex suite of micro habitat, micro habitats or terrains that are being created at every trophic level of that system are what allow the diverse, the continued coevolution and diversification of that system it was designed to work. And so we are, we are short circuiting it in many spaces, many niches. We try to step in and observe without stepping back and observing the entire system and trying to figure out where is our role to step in? Where would we be of best support in the healing of this soil? Does it need us to do anything at all? <clears throat> We can perpetuate that flywheel by keeping that system diversified. And so if we only are putting in a narrow suite of plant families in our system, then we're only supporting a narrow suite of microorganisms that are able to do a narrow section of those specialist roles. <clears throat> and so if our soils are permitted to build on the complexity and it does, it builds on itself. The it, complexity- Get, get, out, of, get out of the way, right? Huh? It's not complicated. Just like it's, support and get out of the way. True, true. Observe, yeah, know what you're looking at. You can't support if you haven't observed first, but yes. Know what you're looking at and then, um, and then step back and yeah. kind of run through the scenarios. If I do this, what will that do? And if I don't do this, what will that do? And um, you know, using biostimulants when the way I do it is faith is I just sit back there and I wait for the obvious thing to do that is the least effort. Yes. <laughs> yes. Or setting it up ahead of time. If I do this and now, see, okay, in six months, I'll do that. And that'll make it so this doesn't happen this year. It, and, Thanks. you know, setting yourself up for success, yeah. you know, exactly. have your time piled, you know, have, yeah. yeah, set yourself up for success. And so, you know, that's where thinking about that baseline, we've got the physical observational assessments, we're reading our weeds, we're, um, we're observing the diversity in our system, we're observing those micro habitats, we're observing those micro terrains, we're yeah. taking that visual assessment of how our soil functions. Um, and then it would be a good idea to do some testing. Um, if our soil, if our system is not functioning in a, in a very- Perfect manner which yeah. means if it's already get functioning. out there and get in the dirt and start doing what you were talking about. So yeah. we'll go to questions if okay. I may, but yeah. I just want to say, I mean, brilliant. 
totally brilliant. Hmm. Thanks, and man. you know, they, they focus on the seed. I've been saying it for many years. John's the one who told me first. 50% of our yield potential is lost on the seed. Yeah. If you don't have the right seed, everything else, you know, you can support everything else. Yeah. But the seed is so important. And I just yeah. loved how you just owned that. And you and can everything. support the seed too. Yeah, you of know, course we, you can support the seed. We, this year, we, can support we got what you the seed, got, but next year. But next year and the year after. And, and two the to year three years after. in and we're done. And it's it's Game that building match. of complexity. You know, it's. Come on. We just got this. build it. <laughs> you can genetically modify things or we can just work with life. Right. I'll we can it. oversimplify. We can yeah. reduce things down or yeah. we can step back. We can yeah. step back and say, this system is functioning. There's a flywheel effect. It's getting yeah. healthier that, you know, we're supporting the health of that mother plant generation after generation after generation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. We got 16 questions online and 18 minutes. So I'm mm -hmm. guessing we'll get another 10 or 20. So quick, what are examples of biostimulants? Great. So biostimulants are, and please do check out Dr. Christine Jones' work yeah. on this. Her, she's staying so up to date, not to say that she ever wasn't, but she's no, no, on no. the cutting edge. She's really- Absolute rock star. Yeah. Wow. I just get so excited when Every i when i listen to her but <laughs> oh christine oh good <laughs> I, love her. I love her so much um she is she's just finished up a four-part series with uh green cover seeds do mm -hmm. check it out it's on youtube on there um yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. do check it out um and any of her um any of her presentations for the bfa those are all foundational information that would be good to have in your um in your brain before you listen to the new stuff, but it's not necessarily necessary. But anyway, a biostimulant is a substance that was biologically produced, more than <laughs> likely um, anaerobically biologically produced is one way, you know, um, a lot of the facultative microbes that produce or do the fermentation um, of substances, and that could be you know, our kimchi, our kombucha, our yogurt, our kefir, those are all facultative microbes that are taking a substrate and transitioning it. They're complexing it. Digesting They're breaking it, it yeah. down. So a biostimulant is a substance that will support, activate, and stimulate Over your minute. biology. Weed tea, you know, yeah. like but you know, I definitely feel like um, sticking with substances that are. I like. I love a good comfrey tea, but if yeah. it's uber stinky and it's yeah. you know if it's putrefying, we'll have a we'll have a future conversation on that. It's like a yes, we got yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, are the viruses, bacteria you mentioned in the soil, same viruses, bacteria that float in the atmosphere, saying that uh, humans get inoculated against diseases? I don't know if they're all the same. I'm not an expert on that. Um, I'm not an expert on anything, but there are yeah. a lot of very similar um, microbial overlaps. families it that are overlaps. shared. Whole biome. Yeah. Whole biont. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you think about a plant, say we went through that whole scenario of the seed yeah. and you have a plant that has its own endophytic microbiome, and then yeah. you take that endophytic microbiome and you make a salad out of it. Yeah. And then you mm. eat it. And with your salad dressing was from the honey from mm -hmm. your land. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to connect. <laughs> How else are we going to get it? You know, if, if we get it from our mothers, but we also get it yeah. from our environment. Which is our mother. Yes. Um, so do brassicas and beet families starve the mycorrhizal fungi since they don't associate? Can we integrate they, mycorrhizal plants with them? They can. It depends on the recovery rate uh, or how many of those plants are in a square meter. It depends on yeah. how, you know, if it's you have a well- Polycultures, polycultures. Yes. If Just you have a well, if you have a well-established mycorrhizal network- How um, far apart are your herbs in your beds? That was 15, 20 when feet. It. 15, 20 feet. Um, okay. It doesn't have to be super close, but my beds, if you look at them are so- they're so complex. I've been there. It would yeah. be a market gardener's nightmare to, yeah. to harvest. But anyway, my bed. keep the perennial flowers and herbs in 
every mm -hmm. here and there. Yeah. So the so the the beet family and the brassica family can actually be supportive to the other plants um, through the mycorrhizal network. The mycorrhizal yeah. network can um, yep. shunt nutrients where they're needed. They do it. They they send. The broader point is an acre family. of tomatoes by itself is not the point. No. Get them. There's no interrelated as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, when you pound the can into the soil, do you fill it with soil? No. Oh, well, when it goes down into the soil profile, it's a very straight edge. So yeah. it's going three and a half inches or three and a quarter inches. You can explain inches the soil. board and the, and the hammer. Mm -hmm. You basically so, take the can, you put yep. a, a piece of two by across the top and a hammer or an ax, mm -hmm. and you just pound it, into it the down to three and a quarter inches. I will say a taller board using a, you know, a two by six would be greater if you could get like a yep. eight, you know, eight inch two by six, that would be greater because you won't destroy your can as fast. Yeah. Um, but you are, you're pounding it into the soil. And so it goes into the soil profile. So in half, in essence, half that can is filled with soil. Yeah. But what it's doing is it's permitting that water, once you pour it in from moving horizontally for and that three and four inch. You cut the bottom out of that can mm -hmm. before you pound it. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. a hollow cylinder. Right. It's right. no ends. It's open. And forward with questions. Um, more please about why not wood chips on beds. Mm. So if it's an annual gardening scenario, if you're growing annuals, wood chips are, they're complex carbon. They're hard to break down. They take a lot of energy. And so for microorganisms to break them down, their bacteria have to have nitrogen as part of their structure. And so their C to N ratio, yeah. their carbon to nitrogen ratio can be anywhere from seven to one to three to one. And so if you're going to put something that is that carbonaceous on the top of your beds and expect it to not steal nitrogen from your annual plants, you'll be sadly informed Unless otherwise. Unless you have an organic bed of 10% and you didn't mix them in and the mycorrhizae you're just pulling back and forth. If you have a mycorrhizal network that is well established, if you have um, wood chips that are pretty well broken down or not yep. brand new, um, if you have um, a very biological system that is already fixing lots of nitrogen on its own, it's well um, aggregated into as being fixed yep. in those macro pores, won't be that much of a problem. Until you get to that point, like John Don't do said, it. you gotta earn it, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I think that last question, um, maybe it was answered. Do you have a good, so two questions here. Do you have a good chart on what weeds indicate what deficiencies or strengths of the soil? Mm. And what are the resources to know what the weeds are telling us? Mm. So When Weeds Talk is a beautiful book. It will, and it's got some lovely charts in it. Um, it's, I think, I think with the information that we're getting now, um, that book could be updated. I, I would love to see a better tool. I've looked yeah. at all of the books that I can get in English um, that talk about weeds and I'm open to any, um, any suggestions. I'm always looking for no, more books so that I can learn more about how to read weeds. But I feel like the, um, the individual who really has the depth of knowledge on this is um, Gerard Ducef, D-U-C-E-R-F, yep. he's French, he's a biologist, and all of his work is in French, and so it's really hard to get access to, but it's really good. Uh, plant Indicators, the Encyclopedia yeah. of Plant Indicators, he has three volumes. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Like I said, brilliant student. Um, I'm just, um, ooh. Um, shall I read Sherry's full, full question? Um, it, it puts you on a bit of a pedestal. Um, Don't do it's that. It's so clear that your intellect and passion for these soil practices is huge. Unlike most in this conference, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. I'm learning at a 100 entry level place, but I love it. It's so encouraging that science is expanding and with it, our understanding of life itself within our soils. My question is simple. What is a basic definition of a structured soil? Mm, 
the basic definition of a structured soil is a soil that has lots of obvious pore spaces that is pulled together into macro aggregates. And there are pore spaces in between those macro aggregates. There are pore spaces inside of the micro aggregates that hold water. There are pore spaces on the outside, the inter spaces. Well, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What's your, the story? I mean, you, it's not I, necessarily I, a soil that you can stick your hand into all cheap. the way up to your elbow, but it could be. Um, yeah. It's a soil that is depending on your parent material, depending on the moisture level of your soil, depending on the organic matter of your soil, um, it looks, it when you pick it up, it doesn't necessarily fall apart. It has yep. structure, but it's little compartments all in there. It's, and you, you know, some people hole, say looks like chocolate cake, you know, but uh, mine don't cheese. necessarily. Yeah. Anyway, the point is like, it's not a concept per se, it's an experience. Yeah, mm -hmm. and smell that. it. You know, <laughs> well, of course you can smell you it. You smell it. You know, and then <laughs> and then you get an indication of who might be present in there. Um, mm -hmm. If you get that smell that um, reminds you of a forest floor when you pull the duff back, then that lets you know that you've got some actinomycetes, some of those filamentous bacteria. If you're yeah. the biggest indicator for soil health, I really think is that rhizosheath, plant health, but also soil health. Yeah. That's a whole nother conversation right there. Mm -hmm. That's a whole separate conversation. Um, um, Chris offered uh, and read Pfeiffer's uh, weeds and what they tell us. I've got that one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Oh, what is my favorite? Oh, I'll. I don't want to look at my phone, but I've got another <laughs> one that I really love, and I can't remember the name of it. Um, Michael Phillips was called out here in the oh. herbal ferment suggestions. Yeah. Comfrey nettle and garlic scapes, just talk about that. I mean, these weed teas, right? I mean, if you, yeah, there's an amazing opportunity there, which I yes. don't on. And you can be yeah. as finessed with it as possible. Like Korean natural farming or natural farming really has a nuanced approach. It's much more elegant than like, you know, a comfrey tea in a bucket that you sit in the back yeah. of the garden. <laughs> um, well, so the comfrey and, tea might be easier. <laughs> yes. But, you know, you can select for different microorganisms in the way that you process this material in, in the way energy to support your plant. Yeah. Growth. And it's all about when energy, right? Going rampant, you just pull it out and throw it in the bucket and you got that energy and, you know. And I mean, use your meters, you know, use your pH meter, use your ORP meter, you know, look at the, look at the um, redox of that substrate. You didn't explain any of that stuff. We're going to have to have you back, Faith. Look at, you know, look at the conductivity. Is it too hot to apply to your plants? You know, is there too much energy in there? Do you, how far do you need to dilute it? What's, you know, there, there are some things that you can do right. to really finesse this, or you can just do some bulk approaches that will move you forward. But the connection between the basic ingredients, the basic practice and the- Right, and so those weeds and the, and the that are- smell or taste, right? Those weeds that are making you angry, the ones yeah. that are just, you know, taking up your bed space, um, they're there doing a job. That's something you can do to help them is harvest them, turn them into a weed Damn tea straight. and apply it <laughs> back on that space. There's you know, they just brought you. all those nutrients yeah. with intention up to the surface, yeah. magnify that. Yeah. Apply it. Massive. That was massive. Um, all right. Let me see here. When do I use vermicompost tea aerobic and when do I use fermented anaerobic brews? Mm. Mm -hmm. That's a whole nother ball of wax. So fermented teas, um, ten, you know, depending, check the, it's good to check the ORP of your um, fermented teas, but if they were done in true- ORP, define for us. It's the oxy oxygen radical potential of your- and so it's the millivolts. It's that redox conundrum. <laughs> um, <laughs> how redox reduced topic. or how oxidized is that yeah. substrate? And yeah. so if that substrate is more oxidized, it would more than likely be better suited for a very um, reduced environment that's struggling. If it's a very 
Um, oxygen rich substrate, it's going to be. Just want, you just want wonky. What's an oxygen? Uh, it, it reduced environment that's struggling. What does that mean practically? So if you have a soil that is really saturated, yep. compacted, holds water for a long period of time, doesn't then have what's more good space. For it? Then what's good for it? That's where more of your um, aerated substances, your um, oxygen rich, your thermophilic compost, probably good there. Your aerated compost teas, probably good there. Your even your vermi extract. I don't think you need to aerate extracts. Whenever you aerate something or you ferment something, you're selecting for specific yeah. microorganisms. And in many cases, our agricultural soils don't need more um, hyper aerobes. Yep. Don't need a lot of those. They're fine. Um, so but in the wet soil, that's what they, they can use. In I lost you there. What? Th th that was an, ex an example of what people could use in the wet soil. Yeah. So in a in a soil that's over oxidized, that's where yeah. your ferments come in. That's where your more reduced substances, your more reduced um, biostimulants come in. Um, so those facultative microbes that you would have in a ferment would be supportive in that space. And these are not inoculants. Um, even your cold water extract from your fungal dominated vermicompost bin is not gonna be an inoculum. It is going to be a biostimulant. Those facultative microbes are gonna be food for the native microbes. And that'll be the same with a lot of the stuff that we apply in this realm that we're talking about, but they're bringing energy. And so reduced substrates, those fermented substrates are high energy. They have a lot of electrons. They are going to help quench those over oxidized soils and but you've got to come behind with management practices you've got to stop oxidizing your soils um you can't have soils that are bare you yeah. can't have soils that are being over tilled or over um jostled you know earlier yeah you, you know if so you got to come behind with the practice <laughs> you follow through yeah well we're in our last couple minutes here, Faith, and I just, I'm, like I said at the beginning, so proud to say that you're the BFA as agronomist. Hmm. I mean, you are so integrated in your heart and your science and your ability to speak simple words. It's, it's very impressive. Um, hmm. Thank I'll just you. Leave with, yeah, no, thank you. Um, uh, Matt has a, a, maybe a simple question or maybe you can go profound if you want. Um, I'm trying to remove the word weeds from, from my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions for alternatives? Unwanted plants is the best I've accomplished so far. No, no, no. Indicator yeah. plants. They're just it's, indicating. It's nature speaking to you. It's, They're it's just nature. indicating. Yeah. They're indicators. And so yeah. what, are you listening? Feeling, sensing, the body is the tool. Yeah, mm -hmm. Sherry says, I love it. The senses as a tool. That's what we're getting to, right? <laughs> we got to use the instruments to get to our being, which is our true instrument. Yeah. 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 Build relationships. Take the time. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. And thank you, Faith. It's been wonderful.